In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. In this video, we're going to follow in Christ's footsteps from the time He entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday all the way through to Bright Saturday. You can use the chapters in the timeline of the video or the timestamps in the description to skip to a specific day in case you want to refresh your memory on what happens on each day of Holy Week. On Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem triumphantly, fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy in Zechariah 9.9, which says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. As he drew near, the crowds chanted, Hosanna to the son of David, and blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The Pharisees asked Jesus to rebuke the crowd, but he replied that even the stones would cry out if the people were silent. Jesus chose to ride a donkey, symbolizing him as a ruler of a renewed covenant. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem marked the beginning of his journey to fulfill the redemption leading to his death and resurrection. In the church on Palm Sunday, we do a procession in the morning where various readings are read at different stations around the church. The procession is identical to the one done on the Feast of the Cross, as the church is reminding us that even though there is a kingly procession on Palm Sunday, the way Christ will truly reign is on the cross. Also during the liturgy, we commemorate the entry into Jerusalem by reading the four Gospels, one for each evangelist's account of this event, so as to capture the full picture of the narrative. Finally, before everyone leaves the church that day, we pray the general funeral and sprinkle water which has been prayed on over the entire congregation. This is because if anyone passes away during Holy Week, there are no additional funeral prayers on the person, as this week we only focus on the suffering of Christ. During Pascha, which is translated as Passover, the church is adorned with black as a sign of mourning. We are not mourning for Christ as stated in Luke chapter 23, verse 28, but rather we are mourning the consequence of our sins. During both the morning and evening Paschas, we chant the famous hymn, Thok Te Tigom, Thine is the power, the glory, and the majesty. Even though to the world the crucified Christ may seem weak and humiliated, we see Jesus on the cross as one with power, glory, and majesty. Each hour we chant the hymn 12 times, replacing the 12 Psalms in the Ikbeya hours. During the Holy Week, we don't pray the Psalms of the Ikbeya since they contain prophecies that will be fulfilled as we go along in the week. On Monday, Jesus cursed the fig tree with many leaves but no fruit, a stern warning about the danger of hypocrisy and that good and evil cannot coexist. As Adam and Eve covered their shamefulness with fig tree, Christ rebukes the fig tree to tell us that we can no longer cover our sins with a cloak of hypocrisy. Jesus then went into the temple and drove out those who bought and sold overturning tables of money changers and sellers of doves. God had previously rebuked the Jews through the prophet Jeremiah for desecrating his house with idolatrous worship. Just like the fig tree, Christ is warning them against hypocrisy and wants his temple to be a place of worship and not a den of thieves, filled with business and corruption. The church encourages us not to think of this week as just an outer appearance of worship, but rather focus on sowing the virtues of repentance, love, and meekness. In preparation for the second coming, the church emphasizes the need to be watchful and ready. On Tuesday, Jesus returned to Jerusalem from Bethany and spoke to his disciples about faith. He also spoke with the Pharisees, Sadducees, and lawyers, exposing their hypocrisy and warning about the destruction of the temple and the persecution of his followers. On the Mount of Olives, Jesus taught his disciples about the signs of his coming and the importance of keeping watch through parables such as the ten virgins and the ten talents. He also revealed that he would be crucified during the Passover. At the end of the day, he went to rest in Bethany while the Jewish leaders plotted to kill him. These events serve as a reminder to remain vigilant in the faith and be prepared for the return of Christ. During the 11th hour of Tuesday morning, Bascha, we chant a long hymn known as Pekethronos, which is translated as, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Because in this hour's gospel, the Lord indicated the exact time He will suffer for us. For this reason, we also add the words, My good Savior, to the chant, Thine is the power, the glory, and the majesty. On Wednesday, Jesus chose to spend His time in Bethany, teaching His disciples and reassuring them that He would always be there for them. The Bible doesn't mention Jesus doing anything that day other than spending His time in solitude and seclusion, just as the Passover lamb rested before the day of its slaughter. Meanwhile, the church's readings that day focus on extreme love and extreme betrayal. We read about Mary of Bethany who sacrificed her livelihood 
to anoint Jesus for his burial with a precious perfume worth 300 denarii, which is nearly a year's worth of wages. Meanwhile, Judas, one of Christ's disciples who served with him for three years, betrays him for only 30 silver coins, the price of a slave. On the eve of Thursday, which is Wednesday night, during the third hour of the evening Pascha, the psalm of Chnon is sung in the long tune. It says, His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords, which is prophesying how one of Jesus' closest friends is the one who will betray him. We also remember Judas' betrayal with a kiss. So kisses and greetings are not exchanged from the eve of Wednesday, which is Tuesday night, until the end of the Divine Liturgy on bright Saturday. On Holy Thursday, the Lord washes the disciples' feet before He institutes the mystery of the Holy Eucharist. The word Pascha means Passover. The Passover is God's promise to save His people, allowing them to pass from death to life. The first Passover involved the blood of a lamb placed on the doors of the Israelites, which led to their deliverance. The second Passover was the institution of the Eucharist by Christ, which is the ultimate fulfillment of the Passover. Christ became the true Passover lamb by offering his true body and his true blood in the form of bread and wine. The Eucharist is a true and living reminder of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and his love for us. On the eve of Good Friday, Christ talks to his disciples for the last time and prays for them. During the first hour of the eve of Good Friday, which is Thursday night, the church reads from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 33 to 1726. This is Christ's longest continuous prayer and is a personal prayer from the Son to the Father. We see how the first Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, while the second Adam, which is Christ, submitted to God's will in the Garden of Gethsemane. Christ urges his disciples to stay awake and pray, as his betrayers are at hand. Finally, his betrayer Judas arrives, handing him over to his enemies with a kiss. Christ is seized and his lengthy night of trials begins. From the eve of Good Friday, which is Thursday night, we add to thine is the power, the Lord is my strength and my praise, and he has become to me a sacred salvation. This is a verse that is found in Psalm 118 verse 14, and highlights how the Lord has become our salvation, and that is through his cross. Also from the eve of Good Friday, until the end of Good Friday, the church will read from the four gospels during every hour of Pascha, detailing the events that happened during that time. On Good Friday, Jesus was condemned by the chief priests and delivered to Pilate to be killed. False witnesses came forth to accuse him. Judas, who betrayed him, later hung himself. St. John Chrysostom reminds us in the homily of the first hour how awful is the love of money. If the love of money possesses someone, it renders him captivated by it. See how many blessings the love of silver took away from Judas. The chief priests used the money to buy a potter's field to bury strangers in. Jesus was taken from the trial by the chief priest to stand in front of the Roman governor who was Pilate. Pilate, not wanting to deal with the situation, sent him to Herod after learning that Jesus was from Galilee. However, Herod ended up sending Christ back to Pilate. In the church, the icon of the crucifixion is hung with candles, censers, and rose petals are placed before it. In the third hour of Good Friday, Pilate the governor tries twice to release Jesus, but finally gives in to the will of the Jews who choose instead to release Barabbas, a rebel and a murderer. Pilate washes his hands denying responsibility for Jesus' fate. Jesus is tormented and stripped by the soldiers. He is dressed in a scarlet robe. A crown of thorns is placed on his head and a reed is placed in his hand. On the way to his crucifixion, they force Simon of Cyrene to bear the cross of Christ. St. Augustine makes an important observation that those who cried out that he should be crucified were the Lord's real crucifiers rather than those who simply discharge their service to their chief according to their duty. We are called to repent and ask for mercy, recognizing the overflowing mercy of Jesus. Through his sacrifice, we obtain eternal life. In the sixth hour, the focus is on the cross, and there are several powerful readings and hymns that highlight its significance. The first prophecy discusses the symbol of the bronze serpent, representing the cross, crushing Satan and death. The second prophecy, foreshadows Christ as the true and perfect Lamb of God who was brought to the slaughter on Golgotha. We sing the hymn of Omonogenes, which has somber tone but also promises hope through the resurrection. The church remembers the darkness that came over all the land when Christ died by turning off the lights. The hour concludes with the hymn Ari Pamevi, or Remember Me, O Lord, which is based on the words spoken by the thief on the right and celebrates the victory of the cross 
which has redeemed all of mankind. In the ninth hour, we reflect on the powerful moment of Christ's death on the cross, when he surrendered his soul to the Father and opened the door of paradise to all of humanity. Through Christ's sacrifice, death no longer enslaves those who die in him. Prophecies from Jeremiah and Zechariah foreshadow Christ's sacrifice and the spread of his kingdom throughout the world. In the church, the lights are turned on at the beginning of the gospel reading. The church also sings the hymn of the cross. The hymn is sung in the sixth and the ninth hour, and it says, This is he who offered himself up as an acceptable sacrifice on the cross for the salvation of our race. During the eleventh hour, the soldiers were instructed to break the legs of those on the cross so that they die immediately. When they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs, already finding him dead. Instead, the soldier pierced the side of Jesus on the cross and blood and water came out. This is foretold in the scriptures when the sons of Israel sacrificed the Passover lamb, putting marks of its blood on their doors, they were instructed not to break any of the lamb's bones. The piercing of his side and water flowing reminds us of the water that poured out when Moses struck the rock in the desert, saving the lives of the people of Israel. We also see the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, showing that there's now reconciliation between the heavenly and the earthly. In the twelfth hour of Good Friday, we remember the burial of Jesus after he was taken down from the cross. The Romans usually left the crucified bodies on the crosses for birds to pray, while the Jewish people threw them in pits of garbage. However, Joseph of Arimathea requested to bury Jesus' body and along with Nicodemus prepared it with perfumes and pure linen. The prophecy for the twelfth hour comes from the Lamentations of Jeremiah, which depict the suffering of the cross and the grave. In this hour, for the second time this week, we sing the hymn Pekathronos, which is a psalm of praise saying, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Also, the veil of the sanctuary is opened, a burial reenactment takes place, and at the end of Good Friday, the 150 psalms are distributed among the congregation to be read, except for Psalm 151, which is to be read when everyone returns back to church for the bright Saturday service. Just as Passover is a joyous celebration of passing over from death to life, sin to holiness, and Hades to paradise, the church leads us on the same path from Good Friday to the Resurrection through Apocalypse Saturday, also known as Bright Saturday. The church is dressed in white as it spends the night with Christ in the tomb, as he goes down to Hades and brings up the souls of the righteous starting from Adam to Paradise. Having paid the debt that sent them there, we contemplate on the transitionary period from death to life with tunes that transition from the mournful Paschal tune to the standard and joyful tunes. In the church that night, we read praises from all over the Old Testament, and a number of processions are alternated between the praises. Also during the service, the church reads the book of Revelation. During the reading, the priests and the deacons surround seven oil lamps, which represent the seven churches who were before the throne of God. The night ends with the divine liturgy. In the liturgy, the hymn of Alleluia, this is the day the Lord has made, is omitted, as well as the reconciliation prayer, since true reconciliation between God and man is fully completed after the resurrection. Finally, after following it in his suffering, we rejoice in his resurrection, just as St. Paul said, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. The resurrection is a message of hope for us all, reminding us that no matter how dark or difficult our circumstances may be, there is always hope for renewal and transformation in Christ. As we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, let us hold fast to that hope, living our lives with a renewed sense of purpose, knowing that we have been given the gift of eternal life through the sacrifice and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Happy Feast of Resurrection, Christos Anastasia.